President's report. I want everybody to make sure you vote on November 5th. Um, that's the citywide election coming up. Uh, mayor of, mayors have, we have two candidates for mayor, of course, John Conley and uh, Bonnie Walsh. Yeah, choose between those two. We have two district council candidates, uh, Brian Gannon and Sal Lamadina. And we have eight at large councilors of which you can vote for four. Um, this is a major voting place. This is where I vote, and uh, hopefully you know where your precinct is to vote. The Good Neighbor Award I want to announce for October was uh, Galleria 33, the restaurant on Salem Street. Uh, the picture has been taken. It will show up in the next regional review, um, and shortly on that side also. Um, so we thank Janet for taking care of that. Um, we have a big weekend. Thank you. Uh, we have a big weekend, of course, coming up. Columbus Day is a big weekend in the North End. Um, Friday night, there's a big cocktail party honoring the mayor. Jason, is there any more tickets left for that? Um, very limited. If you tell me tonight, um, there's $65 each I could add to the count, but tonight okay. is... That's at the Fairmont Battery Walk Friday night. Newer residents get a pass. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> um, Sunday, of course, is the parade in the North End. Starts at 1 o'clock. Yeah, just, can I just announce that the parking restrictions, the parade will the parade will start at uh, City Hall Plaza, go down Core Street, State Street, Atlantic Ave, Commercial. Um, so there'll be parking restrictions all along Commercial, along the, um, the, the Langoni Park and Softball Field and the North End Pool and Coast Guard. There'll be no parking. I think they, they, they have been posted. Um, as well as Battery Street, Hanover Street, Cross Street, and Endicott Street until the parade is over. So that's that Sunday morning, I think, right up there. That's at one of the times in the morning? It starts at one City Hall. The parking restrictions are all more all day, mm -hmm. at, like from 6 a.m. on. So just be aware of that if you're parking in the street. I just have one question. Are they going to street clean after the parade? Yes, Good. the city will follow the parade. Thank you. Yeah, after the horses. So please come out and support the parade. Thank you. And so we have our own election uh, as the last item on the agenda, and hopefully um, everybody will stick around and um, we'll have refreshments and people can converse and talk to our new officers and um, tell us what the uh, issues are going to be next year. Um, and now I'm able to bring that. Government representative Lahio. What happened? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Is Sal coming today? Is Sal? Uh, Anthony? Anthony? I'm with no. Anthony's no. office now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think Sal's office, I think Kathy will be helping, yes. Oh, okay. From what I hear. So Maria Coppolo from... Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi, Maria. No. Oh, Sal said I'd pick yourself up. Nicole, do you have any announcements? No, I'm uh, just Nicole Friedman. Okay. That's yeah. my... Are you Nicole Friedman? <laughs> we always save a spot for Nicole. It doesn't yeah, matter what Nicole. Time. <coughs> okay, so I think we're ready for our committee reports. Uh, Mary, do you have anything for the uh, membership committee? No, I just want to remind if there's anyone who hasn't checked in, please do so, because that's really the only way we can turn your attention to whether you're eligible to vote. So just think I'd gotten everybody else checked in. If somebody wants to sign up tonight, you've got some applications. Absolutely. Okay. Come, come, come. How many members do you have? Did you get a ballot? Thank you. Do you want to give us a report of the cocktail space?
please join us. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, David? Uh, yeah. CLC? Yeah. There was a written CLC report at the front desk. If you didn't pick it up, would you please do so? I'm Dave, the actual chair of the CLC committee, along with my co chair, Richard Branya, front table. Uh, there are no application procedures for vote. That's because the three applications of the ZLC committee reviewed on, sep on uh, I'm sorry, September 24th uh, fell into two categories. One category was letters of no objection. The ZLC committee recommended and the executive committee approved sending letters of no objection to the appeals at 420, for the appeals at 422 to 424 Hanover Street, where the first floor has been retail for many years. It's been a number of different clothing shops, mainly that have opened and for only a short period of time and then closed. Nothing has been successful at that location for many years. I guess it was previously a restaurant called the Blue Front. Um, so they want to convert that to residential space. And the owner of that unit will be living there. 37 Charter Street is a very large, I think it's about 3,000 square foot unit that will be converted, split into two residential units. Uh, and then the other application that we reviewed was 130 Salem Street, Monica's Mercato. Most of you know that Monica's expanded at that location and renovated the entire store in order to continue to sell beer and wine at that location. We need an amendment to their retail alcohol license. And uh, they actually did get approval from the licensing board about a week before the ZLC committee meeting. Uh, so we're simply going to send a letter saying that uh, we we were unable to comment on that application. We don't want to say support or oppose. We're simply going to say we were unable to comment because of the scheduling of our meetings versus the hearing for that item. And that brings up an issue. Many of the items that are going to be coming up at the next meeting uh, have board licensing board hearing dates that fall before our next vote meeting, which is November 14th. Or even, I think in one case, oh, it's, it's an entertainment license falls even the day before the ZLC meeting. So with these licenses, we're losing the opportunity to have community input because the hearings is being scheduled so quickly. And I will add that that seems to happen with certain lawyers representing certain applicants. What I would propose, what I'm proposing is that we discuss with the licensing board a uh, minimum duration to allow not just our neighborhood but other neighborhoods the time necessary to review these applications and provide input on them. So we should discuss that maybe at the next DLC meeting or at the next two day meeting. On the back of the written uh, report in addition to the applications that are on our next VLC committee agenda, and it's huge by the way. Uh, I mentioned the deadlines for submitting public comments to the VRA or to the Secretary of Environmental Affairs on the Boston Garden Project and the Government Center Garden, Government Center Garage Project, and we'll be talking about those later on in this year. Thanks, David. Okay, we have Nicole Friedman, who's in charge of the bike program for the city, and uh, she's going to give us an update on some north end um, work that they're going to be doing. Go ahead. Um, thanks for having me again. I'm Nicole Friedman. I'm with the City of Boston Bike Program. And if you guys have any technical questions, I brought um, John Dempsey, who is an engineer. Uh, but what we are looking at, hoping to do, is install bike lanes on North Washington from Causeway Street, I should point that way, should I, to Mercantile Street. And um, this actually, we recently completed our network plan for the city of Boston. And this one actually rose right to the top as a priority. And how we prioritized 
all the, we actually looked at all the roads in the city, about, drove about 400 miles of roads. Uh, and things that rose to the top for priority were areas that had a high number of cyclist crashes uh, and other crashes. Um, anything that was a bridge, a major connection into and out of town. Um, roads that connected to major employment centers, major downtown areas, um, and cyclist demand. So that's the premise for North Washington. It's obviously, um, as it is for drivers, it's the only way to get into town from Charlestown, uh, Point North, Somerville, uh, East Boston, Chelsea, and Revere. Um, what we are proposing is basic bike lanes. Um, all parking spots remain, so parking is not touched at all. And all travel lanes remain. Travel lanes are not touched at all. Um, in many ways, this is, I think of it a lot like Massachusetts Avenue, where we put a bike lane. Um, I think the roads are very similar. They're both uh, major commuter routes and ways into town, and they're also um, neighborhood roads as well, in this case backing up to the north end, that one, the back bay. Um, this one, we're very fortunate, the, the travel lanes on, um, on North Washington are actually quite wide. They're currently 12 feet to 14 feet, um, and a bike lane is 5 feet. Um, when, when we look at Mass Ave, um, and again, I think it's an important one because it has high volume of trucks and buses. Um, we made those travel lanes 10 feet and 11 feet. Um, and that's what we're proposing to do here. So instead of 14 foot travel lane and a 12 foot travel lane, it would be 10 foot and 11 foot. So you still have the same number of travel lanes, the same parking, the travel lanes are narrow. Our goal in doing this is always, safety is always the first goal. Um, and this will help safety in a lot of reasons. Number one, when you do reduce the width of traveling, it does make it actually calm the traffic and make the cars go a little bit slower, which is a good thing uh, for car crashes. It's a very good thing for pedestrians. Um, the slower the traffic, um, the less serious any injuries, and for cyclists. Um, the other thing we'll do is, in having a bike lane, it carves out a, a separate area for the cyclists. Um, a lot of drivers find it much easier to pass a cyclist because you know exactly where the bike is, there is a line, um, and then there's a the travel lane. So it's organizing the traffic a little bit better in that way. Um, the other thing, that's essentially all I want to say on that, it will go in both lanes. Um, I did want to also report back while I'm here on the safety campaign because that was a topic that came up last time I was here. And I mentioned that we were launching an urban cycling safety campaign. And our goal is to reach all of the cyclists. We've heard from a lot of folks, uh, non-cyclists, um, that cyclists need to do better uh, following rules of the road. So um, we actually looked at all of the data from a crash report uh, and understood, OK, what is going on in the street? What will make it safer for all users? Um, so we launched our urban cycling campaign about two weeks ago. We have um, 30 partners on board. We have every single bike group in the city. That's about 10 bike groups. Um, virtually every college or university uh, and most of the hospitals. Uh, we've flyered 7,000 bicycles in the city with safety message points. Um, we've had all of those groups, Facebook and Twitter and all of that stuff that I can't stand. So about 100,000 100, cyclists have seen all the information. And then we're driving people to a website that has a safety quiz. Um, we had 1,600 people take the quiz so far, including someone from Austria and Germany. You'll be excited to know our training people then. Um, and we did have, um, we're actually mailing out bike lights to almost everyone that takes the quiz, which is a good thing. Um, and the key message points are what we hear in a lot of these meetings. Number one, cyclists following the rules of the road, stopping at the lights. Uh, number two, and I think it's the first time this message point is really coming across, is yielding to pedestrians. And we don't even say, uh, you know, even if the pedestrian is jaywalking, we're basically saying just yield to the pedestrian. Uh, we don't care. Um, and then we're also working on issues with trucks and just staying out of the blind spots with, with trucks. Um, but I want to just see if there's any questions and um, see what I can do to answer things. Any questions or comments? They usually are. Uh, Ed, oh, I, I just uh, I, I wanted to know whether anything on the bridge itself is going to be placed to help motorists stay out of the lane. I think a bridge is kind of a special situation because 
although the, way, the, the lanes seem pretty yeah. wide, are there going to be uh, posts that are a, a, more of a reminder <coughs> rather than uh, rather than just painting it? We're not going to the bridge now or over the bridge now. Oh, you're not going over the bridge? No. Okay. That is a separate project that's being worked on. It's, there's a reconstruction effort for that entire bridge and all the way up rather further back. Right, right. So um, it'll all be more connected, though. But, I mean, if there's a lane south and north of the bridge, bicyclists are going to keep going over that bridge and it's not safe. Yeah, that, that plan is underway, and it is what he's referring to as something called a cycle track. And over the bridge, the goal will be to separate, have a physical barrier between the drivers and the cyclists um, and the pedestrians. So all three will have very clearly designated spots. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm really concerned about crossing the North Washington Street. This road, uh, road, road, road yesterday the day before. And it, it's really dangerous. I understand what you're saying about yeah. putting lines, bike lanes in helps to guide drivers along the road. And I think that happened to quite, quite a bit uh, along Commercial Street. Yeah. But I can't imagine how it's going to happen on you know, crossing North Washington Street. And I say that, I, I wonder whether when you measured the distances across the street, did you do that at the critical locations? There are a bunch of really critical locations that are difficult to drive through yeah. now, let alone with bicyclists hugging the right side of your car. Right. So that's one concern I have. Also, I think I noticed at one or more intersections that the bike path actually goes through the intersection and maybe is painted green through the intersection. Yeah. And I wonder whether you include at just before the intersection where cars stop for a red light, it would be good to paint within the bike path stop on red or something like that or yield to pedestrians some kind of a message to remind them that this green path does not give them the right just to fly through whenever they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and I think that's yeah. a dangerous part of those paths going through the intersection. It almost gives them a license to, some would consider it license to go through the intersection. Right. I also wonder how bicyclists get from the right-hand side of the street to the left-hand side of the street when they want to take a left turn. Okay, mm -hmm. all great points. Um, number one, I Yes, it is a busy road. Uh, it has a lot of crashes for everybody. Um, in terms of cyclists, they're on the road. It's our job to make it as safe as possible, especially when you know there's not really an alternative way that we can send them to get downtown that's any better. Um, and that's what that's very similar to what we had on Mass Ave. Mass Ave has fifty thousand car trips per day, and it has the highest crash rate in the city. And we looked at it, we're like. We can't steer cyclists another way here. That it's, it's not going to work in this case. I, we wish there was a road that was parallel that worked, but it wasn't going to happen. Um, so then it's our job: what can we put in that will reduce crashes? Um, your second point is about the, the green through the intersection. Um, on this plan at key intersections, um, like North Street and Hanover. Uh, Clinton Street, we do have green paint that uh, keep, that shows where the cyclist's uh, lane is versus the car lanes. Um, we do that at challenging intersections, so you don't see it at every bike lane we do, but just challenging ones. And it highlights the fact that, yes, cyclists are here too. Uh, you know, as you're turning, make sure to look and be a little bit more careful. And it works for drivers to remind them that uh, there might be another user on their right. Um, so great point. We do have, um, in a couple instances uh, leading into the intersection, a green box um, that uh, is there for the cyclist prior to the intersection like you recommended. Um, we do have, in fact, uh, the sign you said, um, yield to pedestrians on turns. We have that at Hanover Street and uh, North Street and I am sure many other streets. Um, and it is a great point to have those in there, so thank you. Um, and then your fourth point, um, was how you get from the right to the left. And there's two ways that cyclists do it. And what you're seeing right now is a transition even in cyclists. Um, you know, a few years ago, you only saw the most aggressive and comfortable, or aggressive and confident cyclists out on the street. Um, a lot of young men, uh, maybe a little more reckless, 
um, and they would just put their hand out and move over to the left like a car would and merge over. Um, you're seeing a, a very different type of cyclist now. I don't know uh, any of you seen, but you'll see a lot of uh, uh, parents with their kids on their bikes now and uh, upright bikes. Yeah, and it's a great change to see. They're also much more likely uh, and better at stopping at the lights. A lot of them at, at very big intersections. Um, if I'm trying to go left, I'll cross this intersection first, and then I'll wait, and then I'll cross here. Um, so it's called a two-stage left turn, and that's for people that aren't comfortable merging across. <coughs> and it's sort of, you would be parallel to the crosswalks on that. Oh, I think those are your four points. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not known for asking politically correct questions. And I'm not politically correct either, so that's okay. But, uh, a bicycle lane on Cross Street. Is the city out of its mind? <laughs> I don't think it's out of its mind. Um, it, it worked on Mass Ave, um, and I'm confident it will work here as well. Where are Mass Ave uh, from the bridge at uh, Beacon Street uh, all the way to Melania Pass is a bike lane. Uh, it's a bike lane exactly the same width, five feet, and then the travel lane to Francie? Yeah, just if I may, uh, I live in uh, Francine, I live in the Commercial Street area, and I just, I thought, I found it interesting, you have a sign that says, yield to cyclists on turn. Pedestrians, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, pedestrian, but I think you need a sign down there where we are, or we're in Christopher Columbus Park, just as you're coming from Atlantic Avenue, and it turns to go on to actually commercial street as she turns okay or atlantic avenue continues you go straight you go on to cross street okay you need a sign there that says for bicyclists to yield to vehicles that are turning because there is not enough room if you are coming from atlantic avenue and you are going to make the turn onto the continuation of atlantic avenue before it comes to commercial or commercial street i should because you go straight you go cross street you're making the turn there's really hardly enough room now, because it's almost almost a 90 degree turn. There is hardly enough room if you are a, a vehicle and to make that right turn, because they, the cyclist lane literally stops right there at that intersection, then it picks up as you make the turn. And believe me, without a cyclist there, and you've watched that, many vehicles who are making that right turn as they turn are uh, into, through no fault of their own, are uh, into that cyclist lane. It is very, very dangerous. And just only recently, um, was it last week, a cyclist almost did get hit. And that cyclist did in fact give the vehicle a finger. I mean, and it wasn't who's at did fault. Did you get one back, Francine? I know, it wasn't me. <laughs> I had to be walking back from the beers that night and I saw it and literally, it's very dangerous. There's, there's, there's really concern because the cyclist lane does not continue onto that section of cross street, and I hope there's no interest of doing that. Yeah. And that would be along where the, where I'm talking right at the um, the end of Commercial Street, yeah. where the ramps eventually come out from the from uh, underground um, tunnel. But there's hardly any room there now, and trucks continue to go by there very very fast, yeah. okay. and that's going to be real dangerous if you ever really contemplate putting a bicycle lane there. I just thought that something needs to be addressed there, and they should be warned that it is a da very dangerous turn to um, the right there. We will definitely go look at that and figure out And check for safety, because someone's yeah. going to get hurt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, just about cross, sorry, cross Street as well. And one of my concerns is you know, Cross Street gets wide in a greenway and then narrows when you're going to Cooper Street and there's the 111 bus swinging around. So is, is that, that's not measured like 14 and 12 at that area, correct? It is, it's actually 26 feet wide. Because it just seems, I mean, I know I, I've driven and I didn't get the finger for anything, but uh, I mean, there's, there's been times that the bikes that I should go on the side of the that. Yeah, Cooper Street. So that's just a concern. Just with the 111 buses swinging in that way, I just it just seems so narrow. What, um, Nicole? I want to ask: um, Is the as part of the bicycle program, is there any place where you guys are putting signs up that say bicycles prohibited? Because your analysis has determined that 
bikes just aren't, you know, they're not safe to go in certain places. Yep, the, um, the parks is the primary place, so right now um, decals are just put up in the Boston Common, and obviously Public Garden. Um, How about roadways, though? There are no roadways, well, Storrow Drive and highways right now. Other than that, um, cyclists are allowed on every road in the... And I just, I would like to suggest, because yeah, I think it's great that we're doing the bicycle program, but there are some roads, you know, we've had some debate about whether or not Cross Street is one of them, where it just might not make sense, it might not be in anyone's interest for safety to have bicyclists on those roads, and I just think to have a balanced view of this, maybe we put a lot of bike lanes in, but we also have a consensus that there are, you know, X number of roads in Boston where we really would dissuade bicycles from, from being. Right. Um, I hear you on that. Right now, with Cross Street, there, there is room for the bike lane, which, um, you know, when I think of a road where you, you wouldn't want a cyclist, uh, any highway, any road that's very narrow on both sides, um, with barricades, Casey overpasses a great one where, uh, you, you know, it's a, you might want to tell cyclists don't go on that road. Um, and there's a few. It's amazing with good engineering of what you can do to to change a lot of roads to be a lot calmer. Um, but it's a point. Thank you. This gentleman, may I have your name, please? Uh, <clears throat> I uh, I just wanted to verbalize something that I put in writing to you earlier that, uh, and share it with the rest of the people here. I, my concern is that using a car in the morning and at night on Cross Street, it's a parking lot today, even without the bike limit. And um, there, there are two basic reasons for it. One is that when the cars come from Cross Street onto North Washington Street, uh, you have trucks and buses trying to go from one lane to another and otherwise and trying to get around that corner. And if the, in particular, that corner is too narrow to get around. So there's no, I mean, uh, I cannot believe that you can have a safe bicycle lane in that area because the people go crazy. Um, and uh, it just ties everything up and they're half over into one lane and half over into the other. Um, it can only make the situation worse. The uh, second thing is that right now, the largesse of a slightly wider um, uh, lanes is totally uh, taken up, particularly in the morning on Cross Street, by double parked uh, delivery trucks. Yeah. And unless you tell me that you're going to get rid of, you're definitely going to tow the delivery trucks on that street that's going to make it impossible in the, in the morning. So you have yeah, to enforce yeah. that. You have to tell people, you guarantee people that it's going to be enforced. Right. We, and that is actually, uh, the double parking is an issue that we face regularly. Um, and we usually do work with the police to restrict double parking, particularly at rush hour. Um, the fines are higher for double parking in a bike lane. Uh, we're also realistic that it will happen at times, and the cyclists do know that um, it's never going to be 100% or zero. There will be cars double parked um, in the bike lane at times. So well, it has to be enforced this, better this than it is on yeah. the street. Yeah, and we usually always work with the police before to at least change the habits before, before lanes go in. Yeah. The, the third thing was um, a suggestion. Uh, that if you really want to convince people that this is not going to cause more havoc than not, you should take uh, a week and put down a barrier indicating at, at exactly the point where the bike line is going to go in and see what happens to the traffic. A barrier would, like, the point is great, a barrier would mean no one could park during that period. And what the barrier will do is it will mark off where, where the bike lane is. Nobody is supposed to go across the bike lane. Ergo, yeah. if that changes the traffic patterns or if you get a lot of late letters, uh, or if you see the high up in the morning go from two hours to four, yeah. then you know you've got a problem. Yeah. The letters are now all digital, but that's okay. <laughs> um, 
let me think of how that can be done. If we had a barrier right there, uh, the problem is the just, just a roof barrier is good enough. It's cones with, with uh, trailing ropes. Right, we have to make sure that um, cars can still get into the parking spots because the parking's on. Well, we wouldn't want to take away the parking for the whole thing. Let me, let me think about that. Right. Uh, but I understand what you're saying. Victor, you have something? <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to make a comment and then I hope a constructive suggestion. And the comment is something that you've heard many times before, but I, or in many ways. But I think it has to be stated, which is, as a result of the aggressive bicycle program of the city, cyclists, in my view, shared by others, have, have developed a privileged attitude to the use of areas uh, in such a way as to not observe uh, traffic regulations. For example, riding on sidewalks, riding on one-way streets the wrong way. Uh, if safety is your first goal, uh, I think the safety of pedestrians uh, should also be up there parallel with sa safety of cyclists. My suggestion is, and this came to me uh, from Harvard Yard, where there are a lot of cyclists in the university. Uh, and in the yard, there are sandwich boards saying, please walk your bicycle. Um, it occurred to me that, especially when I, with that in mind, walked by the bike rack on Cross Street, there is a big advertising sign. I forget what commercial enterprise is being advertised. Economist. The Economist. <laughs> it seemed to me that that might be an appropriate place in every area where there is a bike rack and a large, what, three, three or four feet by two or three feet sign, with some suggestions to cyclists, such as uh, sidewalks are for pedestrians, be a pedestrian, walk your bike or something like that. You can, you can yeah. figure out how to say it, but I think it needs to be reminded and reminded and reminded. One, one thing that's been successful in other cities on that is actually decals uh, at the curb ramps onto sidewalks and key areas that just have a picture of a cyclist walking the bike. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually been the most effective mm -hmm. because boom, it's right where you want it and it's always there. We actually put some in um, along Martha Road, um, just a suggestion of the West End, um, uh, in a few specific locations. Well, I would say every at every bike rack, so that when a person rents a bike, yeah. they see it. Uh, in the, the, the Harvard signs were a bicycle with a circle around it and a line through the circle. Yeah. And then please. The, the most effective bike. is what we've seen across the country. The most effective is literally a decal on the sidewalk, right where you want it. So if uh, Hanover Street is the most problematic, you put it right there, and it's, it's been shown to have a big difference. I think there is not one street that's prob problematic. What I'm trying to get across is it's a cultural problem. Yeah. yeah. Problem of feeling privileged, and it seems to me that a cyclist must be reminded, and a logical place to remind the cyclist is when the cyclist is picking up the bike at the rack. Um, and I would also suggest uh, more attention to visibility of the bike. I do see cyclists wearing black on cross street, as a matter of fact, when uh, gasoline trucks are boiling down the street at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, some of them have lights in front showing them where to go or enabling them to pick out uh, problems on the pavement. But from behind, yeah. to what extent are they visible? I think yeah, not visible at all. And I would also suggest emphasis on reflective material. Yeah. So uh, actually, it's a great point. Um, these are, when we have our urban cycling campaign that's going on now, these are exactly the themes that we are emphasizing. So it's yielding to the pedestrians, it's walking on the sidewalk, and it's a lights campaign. And in fact, 
at our last Bike Friday event of the year, which has all the, it's got a few hundred cyclists, and they're all leaders of different cycling groups. We were giving them free lights and putting reflective gear on everyone's bike. Um, so we are on, on it. the back. Oh, Not right. just well, we did front and back, okay. uh, and then the reflective gear was on the front and the back too. So um, I hear you. We can we'll do even more. The campaign doesn't end this winter. We actually pick it up in the spring as well, and hopefully we'll grow it. Um, one more question. Just one <laughs> more. Go ahead, Mark. You were mentioning the deck house as being a good idea. You have deck house going in to the public garden, and nobody takes any notice of it whatsoever. I don't know. Can you write in the comments? I thought that was okay because you see so many people on bikes there. So, I mean, whatever you do, you have to enforce it somehow. I mean, you know, I walk a lot in the city. I never dare even to go, you know, go over a crosswalk because there's always bikers coming up and they don't stop. I mean, it's, uh, there might, like you said, that there are a lot of, of new bikers now, families that are okay, that adhere to the rules, but you still have the young guys and Hispanics or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and it's a sport for them. I mean, they don't, really don't care. Oh, I will, I could talk to the police right after this. So it's, uh, oh, and it I, is dangerous being a pedestrian. I mean, you do have to, uh, I mean, if you're in a car, you're in a car, right? But, uh, right. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. We're going to go to um, some large projects now, which um, the VRA is apparently going to vote on soon. So we want to make our comments while there's still a period of time to do that. We've got our presentations about the Government Center project and about the Boston Garden project. So now we want to finalize some comments uh, from you. Go ahead. Uh, at the time that we put together the agenda for this evening, assume that we would have a draft comment letter on each of these projects, but we're actually unable to put together the comments yet because we're still working closely with other groups, including the impact advisory groups for each of these projects, as well as other neighborhoods, on what the real concerns are that should be vetted further to have a level of assurance that these projects are not going to create harmful impacts to the community. Uh, so I did tonight put together a, uh, a sheet for each of the projects, front and back on each project. The front sheet gives a fairly good uh, rendering of the project. I especially like the rendering I was able to find for Government Center Garage because it shows the heights of these buildings and, and you can relate the buildings and the building heights directly to the description at the bottom of the sheet. So the front describes each of the projects in summary fashion. And the back, and you'll notice that the backs of these sheets have many common concerns or considerations listed. And, and there should be. Uh, many of the issues that we have relate to both of these projects, but there are some issues that are unique to these projects as well. Uh, NURA, especially NURA, has a long history of reviewing large-scale development projects, commenting on them, and, and changing them for the better. Very few projects have we ever stopped, and when we stopped them, that probably was for the good. 585 is now a public school, as you know, and we stopped a four-story underground parking garage from being built right behind old homes with wood foundations at Cooper and North Margin Streets. But we have the history of Battery Wharf as well, where numerous participation in that public review made for a much better project. Uh, and we hope that that will be the case for these two major projects that are being proposed now. They are two of at least 10 major projects that are either under review approved and ready to go into construction, in construction or already built in the area of Haymarket Garage, North Station, and the West End. And I did pass out at other meetings a map showing the locations of the 10 projects along with a table identifying each of the projects and what they are and what stage of the process uh, review, approval, construction, or operating. 
uh, each of the projects is in. If you did not get a copy of that map and table, I do have about 10 copies tonight, so let me know and, and, I'll, and I'll give you a copy. It's important to view each of these projects in the context of everything that City Hall and the BRA are proposing to do, which I call a transformation, a complete transformation of the urban landscape in those areas. And this is right outside our front door. It's very difficult. These projects are much more difficult for us to review, to get our hands around, and to comment on for a number of reasons. One is the rapid pace of these reviews and the fact that the projects are all hitting us at once. And we know why that's happening. That's been reported in the paper many times. The mayor's leaving. These developers are hoping to get approvals before Mayor Menino leaves, and therefore they need approvals before the end of, of this year. There's no doubt that that is the number one reason driving the speed, driving the fact that these are all proposed at this point, but also driving the speed of these reviews. And an example of the speed for which they want these reviews to uh, unfold is something else that makes it much more difficult than we've dealt with in the past. There are separate city and state reviews, and yet they were always conducted in parallel on other projects with one document that went to both the city and the state. It addressed the city's requirements and it addressed the state requirements. In this case, we've got two major projects, each with separate city and state review processes. So it's twice as many documents that have to be reviewed, twice as many comment letters that have to be prepared, and they're prepared, they have to be submitted uh, in a not easy schedule for, for us. So uh, it, this one's a, these two are going to be very tough. Also, they are massive projects that will certainly have impacts around this neighborhood and maybe in this neighborhood, but they're not located in this neighborhood. And uh, historically, we've been very territorial. Uh, don't try to do anything bad inside our neighborhood, but if it's just outside of our neighborhood, maybe we're not going to be as concerned. In this case, we have to be concerned. This, these projects may have tremendous impacts to traffic, and we're hearing tonight already about the traffic conditions along Cross Street, North Washington Street. We know about the problems along Causeway Street during games, Martha Road during games, and at other times. Cambridge Street, go a little further. Cambridge Street going down uh, towards the Charles River. Terrible traffic conditions. Rutherford Avenue, which they want to uh, uh, soon, I think, over the next several years, to narrow that and turn it into more of a, a neighborhood uh, avenue. So where is all this traffic going to go? Uh, so I just want to, I'll go down the list on the back of these sheets. Well, let me just say a few words about the front of these sheets. On Boston Garden Project, I'll just, you can read the details later, but look at the figure, Boston Garden Project. And you can see on the right-hand side, the Lennox Zakeem Bunker Hill Bridge. You can see on the far left side, that lower brown and gray building, it's actually one building, is the Tip O'Neill Federal Building. So the project is between those two landmarks. What you see is a brick-faced platform on the left, four stories high, and another brick-faced platform on the right for six stories high, and those are described in detail below. Those two platforms, plus the center tower, the lowest of the three towers that you see there, that's the hotel. Those components are all part of what's called phase one. And the developer has, uh, has a schedule by which it wants to build phase one of the project. And by the way, phase one falls well within the zoning requirements of the site. The hotel in the center there is about 320, 325 feet high. The zoning height limit there is 400 feet now. Uh, the other two buildings, the one on the right, which is a very large tower for office spaces greater than 400 feet, and the 
very narrow tower on the left is the residential tower that is 600 feet. Those are later phases of the project. The developer has not proposed a schedule for those phases. And from the meetings I've been at, I don't even get a sense of commitment. And, and why is commitment important here? Because the, the zoning was raised to 400 feet something like 20 years ago based on a program of uh, development that was proposed at that time. 20 years later, they still have their 400 foot height allowance, but there's no project, there's nothing built. And you can imagine what raising the height limit from 150 feet or so to 400 feet did for property values at that site. Huge increase in property values, the ability to sell those properties for a much higher price, and yet nothing gets built. So now they want to go to 600 feet. That will raise property values. Again, at that site, there's no commitment, though, on their part to actually build those high towers. So one thing we want to consider in, this, in remaining discussions and in putting together our comments is why should the city and why does the city have to approve the full build-out of the project at Boston Garden? Why can't they approve phase one at this time? And think about that. Think about whether you in this room uh, feel that that phase one project, as described below the, the photo, is something that we need, is something that we could live with, is something that might improve the area along Causeway Street. I, I think that probably most people in the room feel Causeway Street needs some new buildings, needs a better streetscape. Um, it's, it's a wasteland to some extent, and projects like this will improve those areas and improve, uh, I think, the public, the public use of those areas as well. But the, up to what point do you allow development? Up to the point that it starts having serious impacts. And the most serious impact that's been identified so far is traffic. And that's been identified even in their own reports. They say that traffic along Causeway Street is going to double, for instance, by this project. And uh, you, many of you attended a meeting in this room a couple weeks ago on the Boston Garden project. We have a developer here. And in the, towards the end of that meeting, the BRA project manager got up and said, I've heard your concerns about planning. I heard it planning. He now says traffic planning. So fine, maybe it's traffic planning. We said, when are you going to do the plan? He said, we're going to start this Thursday. When are you going to be done before these projects are finished? We will be done with the planning. Well, after Thursday, I sent an email message asking the BRA planners asking the BRA development side to get the planners to come into this meeting tonight and to explain very briefly even what is the scope of the planning study that they're doing with the Boston Transportation Department presumably, what is the schedule for that study, and what is the public process that will go along with that study. And uh, I got this very weird message that pretty much suggested that nobody wants to come in and talk about it at this time. Since then, I've heard that that study hasn't even started yet. So, so the major concern that we have is the impacts on traffic. They have heard us. And because of that, they're going to do a study where we need to hold them accountable for that. Here's another reason for approving only phase one if you're going to approve anything, because it allows time for these kinds of studies to produce the results they need to before allowing the future phases of work, especially where there's no schedule and no commitment from the developer anyway for those future phases. Also, as you build the pieces of these projects, both at Boston Garden <coughs> and at Government Center Garage, that's a phased project as well, you get to not only uh, project or predict the, the impacts, you get to see the impacts. You get to measure those impacts incrementally. And that helps to refine your projections of what the, uh, what the long-term impacts might be of the full build-out. So there's many reasons for doing this in a phased way, a careful way, and making sure that planning, 
planning to identify the, to assess the impacts, planning to determine what improvements need to be made to provide additional traffic capacity, if that's possible. We know we've got intersections out there that are ridiculous intersections. They need to be reconfigured for this to work at a minimum. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that should have been done since 2008 when we had the downturn. What have the planners at BRA been doing for the last five years when development was going nowhere and yet we were, and we were paying all these planners at City Hall? Why weren't they planning for that five-year period? So now everything would be understood and in place to allow these projects to go forward at the level that the planning says is okay. Uh, so that's, yeah, I think you're getting a flavor of the kind of comments that have come up so far from people who've been attending the meetings. I've been attending some of them. Victor's attended a lot of them. There are members of the impact advisory groups for these projects in the room. Impact advisory group is established by the BRA and the mayor's office. People are nominated by elected officials to represent the neighborhoods. Two of them are in the room. Jason Aluya is on the impact advisory group for the Boston Garden Project, and Francine Gannon, you're on for both projects, or just? No, no, no. Just on for the government side of the Okay. So at least we have one for each of the projects uh, here tonight. Anyone else on the IAG? <laughs> and I know David Roderick couldn't be here tonight, but David Roderick uh, has been. Uh, is our impact advisory group for the government of the as well. So I'm really happy to have some members of the United States here tonight to, to hear all of this. Um, over at Government Center Garage, a similar situation. They want to build in phases. They also haven't committed to the future phases of the project. Uh, they do mean to tear down part of the garage for those future phases. So one of the concerns we're cons uh, we have is uh, the length of time that the garage will be torn down, but buildings won't be put up in their place. So you'll have vacant areas for, for a while with those projects. Uh, but similar situation, lots of generation of, of additional traffic. They've explained that they're perfectly sited to mitigate the traffic impacts because they are located at subway stations. But we know that the subway system is already over capacity. That's come up over and over again. And there are no plans that I know of to increase the capacity of the green line, for instance. And the orange line at times as well is overcrowded. The, the only plans I'm aware of are plans to extend the green line that would bring in thousands more from Medford and Somerville and Arlington into the same cars that are already overloaded today. So saying that, hey, we're right on top of the subway station, no problem, or we've provided uh, room for 200 bicycles, no problem, there won't be any more cars. Um, <laughs> and they also say, we're right next to the ramps for I-93. So people will go right into those ramps and won't even have to pass along our surface streets. We in this neighborhood know that people drive around our neighborhood on our streets because they want to avoid I-93, especially in the morning. Uh, and there are, we now have some perfect examples of what can happen when you allow development and don't think about these impacts. You've read recently about the traffic in the Seaport District. The Seaport District, I guess, is gridlocked. The city has now done, or maybe state as well, has done some workarounds to improve the situation as much as they can temporarily. But I, the, the Seaport District is certainly uh, far from being fully built out. I would guess it's about 30% built out yet. So what ha if it's already a huge traffic problem with 30% of the development built, what's going to happen when the other 70% is built? And who's doing anything to correct that situation? Uh, another example is Purchase Street. That's the road that uh, you eventually get when you drive from Fennel Hall along the Greenway on the right-hand side heading down to South Station. It is a mess in the afternoon. 
horrible. The backup from South Station comes all the way back to this neighborhood, and the lights are all wrong to the signalization. I don't know why BTD thinks that the same light programming works when there's light traffic uh, and for, for heavy traffic as well. I, mean, I just don't understand it. But perfect example of what happens uh, is international place. When you're driving along there and you're wondering what's holding up all this traffic, part of the reason for the holdup is the police detail, the privately paid public police detail that's located right in front of International Place. Why? Because they need to get their office workers out of their garage onto Purchase Street. So they have the money to hire a police detail. Where's the public's police detail to make sure that the public flow of traffic is happening at the same time? And here's another project that's located, that was, that was built fairly close to public transit. But boy, it's got a big parking garage and lots and lots of people want to drive to, drive to work. So we're not getting the right information, we're not hearing the right stories from the city. Supposedly there is this traffic study or planning study going on. I think we ought to put pressure on them, and our comments will do that. Put pressure on them to share what they're doing, introduce us to the scope, the schedule, the public process for that. Let us be a part of that process, report back to us, and make sure that they're not going and approving all these development projects in full before those analyses are done because there's no reason to do that on, on top of the fact that it shouldn't be done. Uh, looking at the backs of these sheets, look at the back of the Boston Garden. The very first thing I wanted to include is the fact that there are reasons for wanting development in both of those areas. I've heard those reasons at meetings. I don't know of anyone, anyone who has said absolutely no development at those sites. That's not the issue here. There should be development at those sites, and I think there's a consensus that there should be. Uh, and the question simply is, but how great and how fast? And how much analysis do you have to do? So I did include that first set of bullets there because we want to be able to comment on the, the benefits of these programs if they've done development programs, if they've done right. Uh, conformance with previous plans and zoning, that means what kind of planning has already been done, what did that plan say about what should be, how, how big these developments should be, and are these projects consistent with those plans, and are we seeing the conditions, for instance, the conditions on our roadways that were anticipated by these plans. I know, for instance, that 20 years ago there was an, uh, a plan, an urban renewal type plan for the North Station area. Maybe it's even older than that. But there was a plan, there was zoning change, there were zoning changes based on that plan, and we need to so a level of assurance that what's being built now, or proposed to be built now, is consistent with that plan. But we also need to recognize that there are already impacts that weren't anticipated in that plan. They say all of the development proposed was anticipated when they laid out the new roadways for the Central Artery project. That capacity is already there for all of those future projects. If that's the case, why do we have problems today? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, reconnecting historical neighborhoods. Both projects say that what they, one of the things they want to accomplish, especially the Government Center project, is to knit together these neighborhoods, Beacon Hill, West End, North End especially, that have been separated, isolated for so long. And so here's the opportunity to bring those neighborhoods together, or to, at least to allow a nice flow of pedestrian, retail uses, and everything through that whole area. Only if it's done right. Only if those projects have a significant component serving those neighborhoods. Are those projects designed to, to serve the neighborhoods that, are, that surround them in any way? Or are they um, going to bring in just tourists, visitors, people from the outside. There's that element too, and that's a good, that can be a good thing too. Obviously, Boston Garden has to invite people from the outside world, but at the same time, there should be uh, a level of 
retail, especially retail there, that is neighbor or <coughs> neighborhood oriented, not only for the neighborhoods that already exist, but for the neighborhood that they're trying to create, or at least they say they're trying to create at these sites. Sustainable neighborhoods need a uh, level of retail, certain types of retail, are those being provided at these sites? Number one on that list is supermarket. Full service, affordable supermarket to serve Beacon Hill, West End, the North End, as well as the new neighborhoods at Bullfinch Triangle and, and around the North Station Haymarket area. That has to be there if, it's, if we're going to have sustainable neighborhoods. And that's exactly what the city is doing in many other neighborhoods. They are providing large scale of relatively affordable supermarkets in those areas. Why not in this area? In this area, we've been fighting for 15 years for a supermarket. We've been pushed off and pushed off and, 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 uh, and distracted. Don't look over here, look over there. That's a better site. And then we get our hopes in, oh no, but look over here. There's even a better site over here. And we've got nowhere in 15 years. That, to me, means there's no commitment by the city to include a large, full-service, affordable supermarket in this area. Not yet. There's no commitment, no goal, nothing on the city's part yet. Now, maybe that'll change. That's going to be another comment. Uh, we already talked about traffic capacity. Pedestrian issues as well. Very unsafe pedestrian conditions along Causeway Street very unsafe pedestrian conditions within the intersections on both ends of Causeway Street, uh, over by the West End and also uh, by Merrimack Street and also at North Washington Street. So what's going to be done to improve the pedestrian conditions as well as improve the flow of traffic through those intersections? Uh, open space. None of the project, oh, only one, with one exception, None of the projects of the 10 on the map are providing any additional open space. The one exception is the Lovejoy Wharf project that's now under construction, part of which will be the headquarters of Converse in the building that's being uh, not only renovated but and rehabilitated, but also that's going to go up in height uh, quite a bit. Behind it will be a brand new residential tower. But they are including in that project uh, a waterfront park, and that certainly will be a great benefit. But none of the other projects, including these two projects, is going to provide any additional open space. So what open space are these thousands of re new residents, thousands of office workers, and hundreds of hotel guests, what open space is available to them? The open space we already have, obviously. And uh, is that going to be sufficient? In the North End, we know we don't have enough open space. By any urban planning standard, there's ins insufficient open space. Here were opportunities to provide more open space, especially for those new neighborhoods, but uh, those opportunities apparently are going to be uh, lost or ignored. Hey, on the Lovejoy project, um, are they providing a residential room, parking spaces? I understand Congress is going to have spaces for their employees, but are they, are they having, are they have, do they have parking spaces for the residential rooms? Uh, well, you saw the news recently. That there was always to be a parking component mm -hmm. at that location. Always, through the entire mm -hmm. public review, through the BRA approvals, through the tax breaks that were later given to the developer, through all of that, there was a level of parking provided. And the news now is that the developer wants, the owner wants no parking at that location. And they say that they are being green. <laughs> and, and I say, you're at, you are being green, but not environmentally green. You're being money green. Because they're, they're replacing the parking with residential units. And obviously for them, the bottom line is improved with the residential units over the parking. We know that many people living there, partly because they're going to be fairly wealthy people to be able to live there, are going to have cars. 
And where are they going to park? Well, there's a very nice, I know of a very nice parking lot just steps away from there where some big robbery took place back in 1940. The Brinks, that's what it is. Very good. Uh, and so I'm getting nervous that the price of our rents there are going to go way up because of this, because the district is going to go up. Uh, I have a follow up question. They already committed that, and everything was designated as the due responsibility. How can they legally back down? Because the city says okay, the state says okay. They submitted a formal notice of project change. Okay. And the members of the impact advisory group and others obtained, uh, received copies of that. I'm actually on the impact advisory group for that, and that goes back about eight years or so, I think. Um, and so they go through the process, and somebody makes a decision, okay. allowing it or not allowing it. Well, we also have very specific problems in the area that have long gone ignored, and we want to raise those issues as well. So Charlestown Bridge, for instance. 20 years ago, it was supposed to be uh, rehabilitated. 10 years, it was supposed to be 10 years ago rehabilitated. There's still no promise of it being fixed um, for, the, for the long term anytime soon. It's, it's down a third of its capacity of the six lanes, two are gone. Uh, and I wonder, you know, at what point will the city and state decide to fix that bridge? How much worse does it have? That's designated. Yeah. 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 In 2015. That, so now it's on the schedule for yeah. 2015. Yeah. So there's a few, I mean, I can comment on that. That was federal one. It is. It's, it's, federal federal money. Money. it's on the city. It's on the city's project list. But, but they're going to be reimbursed by federal money. That's what Ralph former congressman told us. That it's going to be reimbursed by federal money, and that's not in the federal budget. Here, the chief. No, that was in the If it happens, it was. If it gets it fixed for the long term, then that's great. My, I, uh, another concern I would have, though, is. Is it going to be rehabilitated at the same time that they're building these two projects? Yes. So some of the, I mean, some yeah. Or, uh, I, just, I wanted to mention one thing about the Government Center project, which is different than, um, than uh, Boston Garden, uh, in that they're going to be doing a substantial amount of demolition. When we had our meeting about that project, um, the architect for the project pretty much poo-pooed and dismissed my um, warning that we may need to think about hazardous material abatement in the demolition process, claiming that the, the chances of there being asbestos in that New York construction were very low, all this with the benefit of absolutely no testing on the materials. Um, as I've talked to construction engineers and architects, and looking at the era of the government center garage, the poor garage built, it's very likely that that material is loaded with PCBs. And the fact that the group is, is, is just poo-pooing the idea of hazardous material abatement really worries me. Um, PCBs are a known carcinogen that builds up in the system. If there's going to be a four-month demolition period with PCBs running around, we're going to have health problems, cancers, um, you know, five, seven years down the road. And, um, and I really think that, um, you know, there, there are a lot of issues that, 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 that you brought up about you know how uh, you know we need to look at the transportation. I think all of those are very powerful issues, but the public health issue is one that I really think we should emphasize in, in, in our response because, frankly, their um, uh, you know, non-interest in that as a discussion topic was extremely disconcerting to them, and I think it should be to everyone. Here. Yeah, I I know uh, from my own professional work that. PCBs especially, asbestos as well and other things, but especially PCBs, uh, there are very strict state and federal requirements, very strict that they're going to have to follow. We need to make sure that they're following those. We also need to make sure, and this came up at the meeting in Boston, uh, I think it was a government center garage meeting, that, uh, that air monitors are in place all over that area and, and coming towards our neighborhood to make sure that even if they do everything they're supposed to do, that these air quality monitors are showing that there's no threat to, the, to this community. There are some things but like why are they poo-pooing it? Because well, they don't want to have to deal with this issue now. 
They don't, all they want now is BRA approval. That's all they want. And by you raising that issue now, it gets in the way of, of that issue. No. And I'm not saying don't worry, they'll take care of it. Always worry, always make sure they're doing what they have to do. I'm just suggesting that they've got a reason now for, for not wanting to address it. This has to go through fast, this approval. Yeah, well, you're I mean, getting in the way for it. I can see on every other issue except the issues of public health. Public health is something that, you know, that's, that's an issue that trumps a lot of stuff. And uh, I didn't think the demolition of Boston Garden was handled very well. There was no containment. You could look inside the building, known to be full of asbestos from the, the, the highway or from any street for months as they were doing that. And uh, you know, we, we probably should insist on containment. They can put a superstructure around and create a, a negative pressure environment so that no air flows out. That's what they should do. And if they don't do it, and then they do some tests and say, gee, you know, we're surprised. There's a higher level of PCBs than we thought. We're already screwed at that point. So, um, you know, I just, I want to, I, I know that it's inconvenient for us to ask for stuff like that, but I just really do think that the yeah, PCBs have stopped projects. So it's just too expensive to, to do it. And so you just walk away from it and keep, keep it where it is. And so I would hope that uh, for their, uh, in order to to protect their uh, financial interests and their financiers, that they uh, that they understand what the ultimate cost will be of doing that work. And, and it's not that expensive for them to find out. They can go in to appropriate places in the building and take samples and do the analysis for you know a fee for the architect for three days. I mean, it's, not, it's not a big issue. Nikki? Yeah, this um, isn't it immediately pressing is the health issues, but I was struck by your comment um, when the architect was here for the uh, TD Garden project that um, no attention had been paid to the impacts of the river. Um, what they did say is, oh, that we won't have much shadow into the north end. Well, there's going to be shadow somewhere, and is going to be into the river part of the day. And also, it sounds like the project's going to be built right up next to the river. So in the letter about the Boston Garden project, I would suggest adding something about environmental study of, for the river state. And the shadow studies are in the document that's now out for public review. There are two documents that are out now for the Boston Garden Project. One is called the expanded, no, draft project, no, I'm right, expanded project notification form. That's a BRA required document under Article 80 review. Expanded public, uh, expanded project notification form. The reason they add expanded is an, it's another indication that they want this thing to go through very quickly. Typically, a project notification form describes the project fairly generally, and based on that description, the public and the city decide on the issues that need to be addressed, the environmental assessments that need to be done, and so forth and so on, uh, in the next report, which is the project impact report. When they add the word expanded, it means they've tried to put all of the anticipated assessments into the document already so that they won't have to do the next report. So it's just another way of, of getting approvals faster. Uh, the other report that, so that's the expanded project notification form, which is the very first report that goes out uh, under the BRA Article 80 review. On the state side, the very first report went out a few months ago, I think back in May, that was what's called an environmental notification form, and the developer just recently issued what's called a draft environmental impact report, it's huge. And so we're having to look at both the, the document for the BRA review and submit comments to them, and the document for the state review and submit comments to NEPA. 
Uh, and then the government said a garage. The report that's out now is the draft project impact report for the DRA, under the DRA review. <clears throat> um, just, just curious on the answer. I mean, the Gulf Center garage is 2,300 parking spaces. How, how are those, what's, what's the plan for sort of recouping from that loss? <coughs> these, are, these are mostly events that has to do with a lot of business in the North End. Uh, these are people that are in and park. What's the plan for replacing this? Because they're going to park some way. So people are going to come in and see games and stuff. Yeah, uh, not all of them, of course, are going away. Right, they're, but they're going to put back half over a phased project. Right? Yeah, half of them will remain. And the reason for only half is twofold. One is that the current garage never fills up by, by hundreds of cars, uh, hundreds of spaces available. It just never fills up, even during garden events, according to the developer. And the other reason is that given the types of uses that they're proposing there and certain ratios, or how much parking you need for those uses, that they have the right level of parking for that for that location. Uh, it seems to me that they're providing just enough parking for their own project needs and no more than that. So anyone else that uses the Haymarket Garage, just come in, park there, go to Government Center to do whatever you have to do, or visit your doctor, or whatever it is, uh, that parking won't be available for those purposes anymore. Is my, my feeling at this point, but I, I need to look further at the numbers and discuss it with other people. I, I went through a calculation on this half-empty garage, and that's that's a falsehood. Uh, it may be half-empty in the evenings because they sell it all day for day parking. And then they expect to get that back for events. Uh, the evenings that they have events, it, it's comes very close to selling out. And what they've done is basically resell the same uh, units. And they and, and the people that come during the day pay as much as we do on some of the other lots here for 24 hours. Whereas they resell all of those things. And if you go through those numbers, they have done just exactly what every other one of these garages has done, is they optimize their their fees based on how many people were coming into that cost uh, for the number of, of parking spaces they had. If they didn't do that, they should be charged. Because that's what it's all about. And if you, if, you, if you then reduce the number of spaces, then the revenue per space goes up because they raise the fees. Exactly what happens, and that's exactly what and you said it before. Exactly what's going to happen. So we can see fifty percent of some of the parking. I do want to give, I do want to give folks in the room who, who have strong feelings about the value of these projects, whether in full build out as proposed or, or at least the concept of developing these areas. I, I do want to hear from from anyone who wants to, to, like, to discuss some of the benefits that will be seen from these projects. Well, we can do that, I think, after we break up. Yeah, we'll, we'll have more discussion time here. Okay. Thank oh, you. Hey, the other Sorry. thing, anyone in this room, please, if, if you have an interest uh, or have the time, or even if you don't have the time, uh, join us in putting together these comments. Get in touch with me. We are, I talked with the West End Civic Association today. They want to get together with us next week. I've even talked with a labor union that's very concerned. Their workers are concerned about the traffic impacts of this. I'll be speaking with them some more next week as well. But it would be wonderful to have a few more people looking at the documentation and helping to put together these comments. Let me know. Uh, given what we said tonight and what other people have said tonight, uh, we would like to have authorization from the committee to put together, from the members, sorry, to put together the comments 
in tandem with other organizations as well, in line with, completely in line with what's been listed here. Is there anyone that has a reservation first about us sending a comment letter in line with the items we discussed tonight? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, we're going to have our election now, and uh, afterwards we'll have refreshments. And I'm going to turn it over to Victor since I'm up for our re-election. Okay. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is thank Jim for turning it over to because this is the first official act that I will have performed as vice president in the year that <laughs> since I was elected. <laughs> so, and, I, and the last, because I'm not up for re-election. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, invite nominations from the floor. Is there anyone who would like to nominate anyone or nominate themselves for any of these uh, one, two, three, four, five positions. I, I hear silence. So let us move on then to the slate that has been recommended by the nominating committee. And that slate is uh, set out on your uh, agenda uh, at the bottom. And I'm, uh, Jim has suggested, and I agree, that the persons on the slate should um, introduce themselves to the membership. Sure. Who, who was the nominee? Who was the who composed the nominating committee? Uh, Jim, uh, I don't remember. Um, it was um, Michael Giardiello, who was our treasurer, and uh, Robin Reed, who's our um, appointee to the Greenway Commission. And I asked a couple of other people, and they couldn't make it, so I appointed myself as the third person. But Michael was the chair. And so we reported to the last uh, meeting of the executive committee um, the nominees we had lined up, and they approved putting them on the ballot. And, and you know, the, the real purpose of that committee is not to decide who among all our members deserves to be run for this office or who would be best to run for this office. But, but the only effort uh, unfortunately is, and it's a tremendous effort, is reaching out and trying to get people to be willing to run for office and to serve. And so they did a lot of work to find these individuals and to convince them that, uh, to convince them to serve. So I think it's great. Um, and Jason, I'll ask again, would you like to nominate someone from the floor? Oh, no, I was no. just curious about okay. the process. I'll nominate Jason. No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a nomination, but I also heard a decline. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, what, th then what I'll do is, is start, uh, start at the bottom and work up and ask uh, Ed Rice if he would just sure. um, introduce himself and say what he'd like to say to the membership. Um, so I'm Ed Rice. Um, I live over on Snow Hill Street with my wife and three and a half year old. Um, I, I ran for community council uh, like a month and a half ago, lost by a couple hundred votes, but um, it was really a result of, uh, of, of uh, my wife and I kind of getting together and, and, and we decided that I, I should get involved with the community. Um, the reason was um, I have been, I've been an architect for 15 years in, in, in Boston, and um, I have prepared these types of presentations or been a part of preparing uh, to go up uh, for community approval, and, and I have worked for the most part um, nearly every single year of my career for very wealthy um, uh, institutional clients in the city. And so I felt that uh, at, at some point I had to um, start to uh, get involved with the community and start to give some of that expertise back. Um, I think what really um, convinced me that this is what I should do was I am convinced that the city of Boston uh, needs to provide uh, this community with more planning and technical uh, support in some of these decisions. This, these are major issues. Um, this, the, if you add up the, um, uh, the square footage here, we're talking about 5 million square feet over the next um, 10 years. Yes, there's an infrastructure void. Uh, the, those are some particular special interests of mine. I, I think that 
uh, this whole this whole area in, in, in order to be able to accommodate this type of um, these types of ideas needs to have attention. I have um, an interest in accessibility and also um, severe weather. I think those are issues that are going to affect the community. I guess, is there any questions that anyone has of Ed? No. And uh, on the subject of planning, I, I, I can't uh, lose this opportunity to, to once again point out that Article 54 of the Boston Zoning Code is the North End Neighborhood District. Um, the introductory paragraph says, um, this article is pursuant to section something of section something of the general laws of Massachusetts, which deals with planning for neighborhoods. I went to the BRA after <coughs> reading this and asked for a copy of the plan, which, by the way, it was adopted in, in 19, 19, well, amended in 1993, but I think it, it was adopted just prior to that. And the BRA said, no, we have never uh, prepared that plan. Um, Phil, it's in the first section of the zoning code applicable to the North End Neighborhood District. But I digress. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, the nominating committee that has nominated Elizabeth Gisolene of North Square as secretary, would you like to? Say a few sure, words to yeah. My name is Elizabeth Gisselaine. Um, I live at North Square. Um, I've been, I'm just going into my 10th year of living here in the neighborhood. And um, I um, am trained as an architect. I practice as an architectural designer um, with my partner, Sandra Corella, who grew up in this neighborhood in North Square. Um, I also teach at Wentworth Institute of Technology as part of the architecture department there. Um, and I am, um, I am just invested in this community and have done a number of, um, I've done, I've been conducting research in this community um, uh, for my own interests um, as well as um, uh, with some of the um, coursework that I um, conduct with my students um, and we look to this neighborhood for um, for great uh, information and, and um, inspiration um, in our coursework. Um, and yeah, I'm just excited to have this opportunity to participate and give back to the community. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions of Elizabeth? No. 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 Okay. Uh, next, uh, working upward, is uh, Nikki Rafter. Okay. Who you have seen before, but she may have something to say nevertheless. Well, I'll just speak very briefly because I, I was um, secretary for two years and then took a leave <coughs> from the officers and now I'm back trying to replace Michael. Um, I'm a professor at Northeastern University. I um, lived in the North End for six years. When we arrived in the North End about six years ago, um, almost immediately, uh, one of the restaurateurs tried to build a new restaurant that would back up to about, was it 12 feet of our bedroom? And um, so immediately there was a big community struggle over that. Thank God for Carol over there. She got over 100 <laughs> um, signatures on the petition. We just she sort of taught me how to mobilize the community and I thought I'd gone to heaven when I learned that there was a group called NURA that would help residents with these problems and so uh, the restaurant term didn't win and we sleep at night much better. so and I, I yeah good for NURA and I'd appreciate an opportunity to serve again thank you are there any questions for Nikki? No. no. Uh, next is for Vice President Ford Cavallari. Hi, everyone. I'm Ford Cavallari. Um, I've lived in the, the North End since 1995, uh, and professionally, I am a mathematician turned 
software entrepreneur turned uh, management consultant. While I was a management consultant, I worked for a lot of large corporations that were my clients. Uh, and it was probably more likely that you would see me in an airport lounge somewhere or, or uh, a, a, the gangway of a plane than you would on the streets of the North End. Fortunately, I've sort of quieted down my consulting life and I'm appearing in the North End a little bit more. I've been a volunteer for the Friends of Christopher Columbus Park for, um, for quite a number of years, since uh, 2003, and recently have, have been running their infrastructure committee, uh, doing, among other things, trying to refresh the trellis lights. Um, but over the last year, I discovered, uh, or perhaps rediscovered, because I wandered into a couple of meetings over the years, the, the newer group, and have been extremely impressed with the amount of action that uh, happens in, these, uh, in this room. Uh, and, um, and I would very much like to serve. Uh, uh, you know, people have told me that I can talk a dog off a meat wagon, and if that's a skill, I'd like to put it to, to your benefit. So thank you very much. <laughs> You want to well? Yes, and I have, seen, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have seen a lot of you on the streets of, of the North End before, so that, that's good. I'm glad that that has happened. Are there any questions no. before? No questions. Okay, finally, we have Jim Cellini, uh, who has been nominated for president. Um, I think to, some of you know my background. I explained last year I'm uh, a lifetime resident of Boston. I've only lived in East Boston for the last 10 years in North End. Um, I brought up three problems at the beginning of my presidency, and I just want to report on any progress we've made. Uh, the late night drinking and noise problem, obviously, is still with us. Uh, we did pass over the past uh, year um, an amendment to our alcohol policy saying that we would not accept more than 91 licenses in the neighborhood, and we wouldn't vote beyond that. Well, we currently have 91 approved, but there's only, as far as I can tell, 86 operating. There are a lot of businesses coming and going, closing. I'm sure you've heard of some of the closings recently. So it's not a pot of gold that the restaurateurs are looking at, that they, everybody wants to start a new restaurant here. Most of the new restaurants are replacing for old restaurants. Um, and I think we're going to be able to hold the line very well. Uh, I think the hot places are like South Boston and maybe these new developments. But um, I think we're doing okay with that, and um, less late night uh, bars open, and I think we'll have less late night drinking. Um, a second problem, was, of course, was our street situation with the trash and everything. Um, I know if you read the blogs, you're probably going to think it's worse than ever. I think it's better than ever, actually. Um, you can think negatively, but um, just in the past year or two, we've had a lot of great organizations taking on this problem uh, beyond NURA. Uh, we have the North End Unification Committee, which has done some great work on Cross Street and during the, the Christmas season. Uh, we have the Friends of the North End Parks, which is supplementing the work that the Greenway does on Cross Street and other areas, planting flowers and so forth. Uh, we have the Rough Group, which does their cleanups every month. We you know, celebrated them last month. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has even done a couple things recently for Cross Street and for organizing cleanups. And so uh, I think there too, um, we're, we're making our voices known and we're, we're doing the work in, in cleaning up the place. Um, the third thing I mentioned then was we needed a supermarket, and Dave has alluded to that tonight. Our last and best hope is the Boston Garden Project. They've left the space in the basement, 45,000 square feet, so the supermarkets can't say it's not big enough. Indoor parking, they can't say there's no parking. 10 or 15 minute walk from where we are here. Um, it's gonna be done in the first phase, which is a four story building, um, and the basement would contain the supermarket. Now I, myself, am not gonna support that project until they sign a contract with a major supermarket chain that they can't get out of. Um, we want it done before they break any ground. No more promises, there's no other hope, this is it. And I think we're gonna be able to do that. Um, I think we might add a fourth this year, which is um, something that your husband, Tom Skidoni, has done a lot of work on, which is getting the tourists restaurants. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, it's absolutely necessary. We, we bring a lot of money into the city with our, um, our tourist areas, our historical buildings, our, uh, just our great atmosphere in this neighborhood. And um, it's less than $100,000, so I think between the state and the city and private enterprise and so forth, we should be able to get that. So we'll push on that too. 
Um, I don't know who's going to be mayor. We have two people who are running. Um, I'm not particularly close to either one, but we've got some good people on the city council. I might say Anand is one of them, and she's doing some work for us. And um, so I think we can pressure whoever is the mayor to um, loosen the purse springs and, and help us out. Um, I, it's been an honor to uh, be a president, and um, I thank you all for supporting and uh, basically behaving. I think we've had, we've had no outbursts the past year, no profanities. Um, I've heard it was much worse in the past, and so um, I thank you for that. And, um, I look forward to the next year. So um, please hang around, and uh, we'll um, have some refreshments. Okay. Any questions for Joe? No, no. no questions. Okay. Now, uh, Dave has diligently prepared ballots. There's a, a, a yellow uh, ballot that we don't need at all because it's just in case we needed a ballot. Uh, there are white. There's a white ballot uh, asking for a vote on each one of the, uh, of, of the slate. Is there any reason to use this white ballot? Okay. Okay. Uh, Move a unanimous vote for all. All right. Uh, second. Bob at the back of the room. Bob at the back of the room. As he does every year. There's no other no other person uh, nominated for any officer. I move the secretary cast one vote for the slate. All right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> You're the secretary. Do you vote for the slate? I vote for the slate. All right. Thank you. Congratulations to you all and welcome. Um, will someone move to adjourn? Will someone second it? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.